Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? How do you embrace the part of you that's been shunned by others? Is that a part of your conditioning or was it hidden because of the conditioning in itself? Today, we're going to be talking about sensitivity. To be exact, being a highly sensitive person and what does that mean? This is one of my favorite conversations to date because I learned so much about the part of me I neglected and saw as a weakness growing up. So what makes a highly sensitive person, also known as HSP? My guest today, Brooke Nielsen, will break it down for us. Brooke is a trauma-informed psychotherapist and a founder of the Therapeutic Center for Highly Sensitive People. Over 15 years, she's helped hundreds of people find freedom from anxiety and self-doubt. With advanced training in trauma, therapy, and relationships, she spent thousands of hours helping highly sensitive people thrive. She's also the founder of Intuitive Warrior, an online learning community which helps HSPs discover the gifts that lie hidden in what they thought were the worst parts of themselves. In today's episode, Brooke shares how being a highly sensitive person is not a disorder, the gifts of being an HSP and the downfalls if it's not used in alignment, the traits and different spectrums of being an HSP, some common challenges HSP face growing up, the healing aspects of trauma work and how sometimes we get lost in comparative suffering when in fact there is no trauma hierarchy. Her experience in learning she's an HSP and how that knowledge helped her go from being constantly anxious on high alert all the time to being better equipped in handling her triggers. The importance of energetic boundaries and how to set them and so much more. Come join our beautiful chat. Hi Brooke, welcome. Thank you for coming to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. I've been following your work for a couple of months and you specialize in highly sensitive people as a therapist. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Thanks for having me, Jess. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. So yeah, I'm a um, licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice in Boulder, Colorado. And I specialize in working on trauma healing and also in helping highly sensitive people realize the gifts and what they thought were the worst parts of themselves. Mm, I love how you said gifts and I'm so excited to dive into that a little bit more. Um, How would you define what is highly sensitive person? I'm so glad you asked because most people still don't know. This is still kind of a, a new term coming out. So being a highly sensitive person means being born with a trait. And there's actually a scientific term for this trait. It's sensory processing sensitivity and about one in five people and actually one in five animals as well are born with this trait of high sensitivity, which is, I know it's wild. And it is actually a, the trait of essentially pausing before acting. Mm -hmm. So there are, there's this acronym DOES, D-O-E-S, that describes the characteristics of this trait. So those watching and listening can kind of think through whether these apply to them. So the D in DOES means depth of processing. So highly sensitive people have more going on, more brain activity, more emotional activity when we encounter stimuli like a dog barking, a car horn honking, When we take in um, new information, when we have emotion, there's literally more processing going on. 
And then the O in does is overwhelm. So because we are processing everything so much more deeply, we get overwhelmed more quickly than non-HSPs do. Kind of reach our max. Yeah. Um, E stands for empathy and emotional intensity. So HSPs are amazing at empathy, just so naturally good at putting ourselves in other shoes. And we respond more strongly. Our emotions respond more strongly to our environments. And then lastly, S stands for sensitivity to subtlety. So we pick up on nuance. We notice a change in expression. Uh, something is different in a, in a room. Something's been moved. Uh, we pick up on the nuance. So those four characteristics are what make up this traits of high sensitivity. I mean, I've talked to you before and I think just from reading a lot of the articles, I definitely identify with being an HSP. But growing up, there was so much stigma or maybe because I was being told that I was too sensitive, that I cared too much. Mm -hmm. So I really tried to maybe unconsciously like deny that part of me, but it still didn't change the fact I felt a lot of things and I didn't yes. want to admit it, like going to a club. I mean, yeah, it's fun when it's a group of friends, but I don't enjoy it. Like I wouldn't enjoy it while some people love it. They love that environment or, yes. you know, going to crowds. I just feel so exhausted all the time. And I thought maybe I'm just an old woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. So I'm curious, like, how did you find out about HSB? What was your journey around it? Mm. Well, thank you for naming what you did, because your experience you just named is so, so, so common. And most people just feel like they're the only ones going through that. But so many HSPs, I know me included, spent many years trying to hide this part of ourselves because we are in the minority in this way we experience life. And it can be easy to feel like, what's wrong with me? Like, yeah, and why? And people say people you're exaggerating. Say so you don't wanna be <sighs> too much. A hundred percent, we get the, you're too sensitive, you need thicker skin, don't let it bother you, stop worrying, calm down. Oh my gosh. And all of those things, you're right. Especially as a sensitive person, we're taking that in deeply and going, wow, maybe there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So to your question of, of, let me see, was it how I was impacted or what growing up mm -hmm. was like for me? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I think I became aware pretty early on that I felt like a fish out of water. I felt like I don't think the way that my peers do. I have this really vivid memory of being in I want to say fifth grade, maybe, and standing still in, in my school, watching my the classmates like run back and forth and kind of screaming and just having fun. And I remember I was standing there, like thinking about life. I was standing there thinking about, wow, I only have one more year of elementary school. Oh, wow. That means I'm leaving childhood. Oh, and I remember feeling fear and grief about that and confusion. What does that mean? And then that like contrasted with these kids just like Wee! running around. And I, <laughs> I just remember really knowing um, by that point that it was a better choice for me to not share those thoughts with my peers because they wouldn't get it. And I was afraid and I thought I knew I would be seen as like weird or I just get kind of a blank stare. Mm -hmm. So already I had learned, you know, keep that to yourself because it's kind of weird and embarrassing, but that's hard because not I was keeping something to myself that was pretty distressing for me that I needed help to work through. Yeah. So yeah, I think that that's a good example of like what growing up sensitive was like for me. That's so fascinating because as you were sharing your story, you reminded me as a kid, I had these fears of moments fleeting, like, oh, this will be the last time. And then, or I'll, mm. I'll have this fear of my parents dying, which a lot of kids have, but I, I would 
feel it and would keep me up. And you, you named it as grief, grief for what I could lose, and I didn't know how to handle it. And my parents were just like, "Don't think about it." <laughs> Obviously, they didn't know how to. Yeah, they're like, "Just go to bed. It's so late. Why are you thinking about death? You're so young." And then like your dad doesn't like to like to talk about death. So like knowing that sometimes our perceptions growing up, kind of like nothing's wrong with you, like you said that. This wasn't anything wrong with me for feeling those feelings, because I still have moments where I felt this utter despair of a moment where everything was completely peaceful, but I didn't know why. Yes, I'm so glad you said that. That is a big piece of the journey for HSPs who I work with is coming to that deep ownership and realization that nothing is wrong with us. It is, it is a difference, not a flaw because a full 20%, 15 to 20% of the population has this trait. That's too many for it to be a disorder. Mm -hmm. Like it's too many people. It's not, it's not that rare. And then two, it comes with tons of gifts as well as struggles. So it's really, it's, it's not a disorder. Um, And then it's just, it's a difference kind of like you know, whether I'm born with blue eyes or brown eyes, like it's, it's neutral, right? It's just a trait, right? And, and we're, so many of us have been indoctrinated to believe that it's actually a flaw to be hidden. But like you said, in truth, there's nothing wrong with us. This is just how we're wired. Yeah. Yeah. Just like someone might have a good year in music or taste buds to be a chef we're just in tune with emotions and are there like different levels of hsp such a good question so the you're actually speaking to some of the newer research so historically the research has been are you hsp or are you not and by the way if anybody wants to check out am i hsp Mm -hmm. the there is a self-test you can take at hsperson.com forward slash test. Hmm. So there's this test where you can find out, am I an HSP? And so historically it's been like, okay, you're HSP or you're not HSP. But from what I can see in the research coming out as of uh, recently, it actually looks like sensitivity is a spectrum. Hmm. So it looks like there's low, medium and high sensitivity. Um, So for example, my husband, he scored, like I score very high on the sensitivity test. He scores right in the middle. And I see that reflected in his life. It's like, there are ways that he's, he's very attuned, he's sensitive, and there are ways that he's not. So he's kind of, I'd say medium sensitive. Mm -hmm. And one more thing I want to say about that is that I like using the term non-HSP instead of not sensitive because sensitive does not mean, if you're not an HSP, that doesn't mean you're harsh, unkind, critical. We're really, we're not speaking about a personality. We're more speaking about a nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. So it just means they're not as finely tuned the way that we that you share that because I've also seen convert you know online you find conversations about everything and there's this movement or people say like everyone's an empath we're all like you know connected to each other and yeah Mm. we do have different layers of sensitivity but some might be more enhanced and we're told that we shouldn't feel this way because everyone has this trait and it's kind of like oh you know (laughs) That's so funny. And that's just not the truth. Yeah, it's just not true. It's like, yes, everybody has, or probably not everybody, but almost everybody has the capacity to empathize. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the capacity to respond to their environment and have feelings. It's just, yeah, it's a matter of degree. Right. How far is your dial turned up? Yeah, Yeah. I love that expression. Mm. (laughs) You mentioned a little bit about what are the gifts an HSP has. Mm. Can you dive into that? I'd love to. So HSPs are incredibly conscientious. You know, we, it's hard for us not to be aware of how our actions are impacting others. We're thoughtful. 
you know, two things that I think our world needs a whole lot more of. Where you know, obviously we've mentioned empathic, that's a, a huge gift. We, our deep emotions allow us to be incredibly passionate people. So if something is exciting to us, you know, it's going to show like that passion mm -hmm. can drive us to pursue that thing of interest. And if we see something that's wrong, we're going to be passionate about it in a way that may drive us to take action and make a difference. Mm -hmm. We are very present in relationships. So we can also have struggles in relationships for certain reasons, but we really take our relationships seriously. Like we don't take them for granted. We really notice the feelings of our partners, of our friends. We care about how they're experiencing us. Mm -hmm. All right. And then one of my favorite gifts of for HSPs is intuition. And actually my uh, online company supporting HSPs is called Intuitive Warrior. Oh, That's yeah. the name that I like for us. And we're incredibly attuned to our intuition. When people come to me, sometimes they actually are, are quite disconnected from their intuition because they've been ignoring it for many years. Mm -hmm. But when we pull back the layers, we have the capacity to tap into that inner voice that has wisdom and knowing and insight mm -hmm. and direction in a pretty profound way. I love all that. And as you were sharing the traits, I was thinking this might lead to the struggles that an HSP has, but mm. are we, do we tend to people please just because we're so aware of it? Do we tend to put ourselves in the back seat because we're aware of everyone else's need? Or maybe that was my experience growing up. Yeah, I, I think that's incredibly, incredibly common. In my experience, HSPs tend to respond in a few different ways ways to, you know, essentially we have this finely tuned gift, but it can be really intense to have this gift in this intense world. And so we mm -hmm. all figure out ways to cope. Like, how do I go through the world and feel okay being this sensitive? So one really common way that people cope is being super tuned in to others, like, how are they feeling? How do they feel about me? What are they thinking? I used to call it my feelers. And mm -hmm. I remember 10 years ago, I felt like these almost antenna I had, energetically scanning my environment, picking up, you know, how everyone was feeling, what was the mood? Was there any danger? How did they feel about me? And that was a strategy that I had adopted to try to stay safe. And so to your point, people pleasing, trying to be really nice, trying to make sure that no one's mad at us. I think that's incredibly common because when someone is upset with us, given how intensely we experience the world, that can be really painful, be really yeah. scary. Yeah. So that's one direction that I've seen a lot of HSP swing is let me be more attuned and try to in a way control my environment. Mm. Let me try to keep anyone from getting upset, keep bad things from happening. And then I don't know if this is less common. I don't have enough of a data set to know, but another direction I see HSP swing is getting actually more hardened and more blocked off. So like, you know, I am tired. And a lot of times this happens unconsciously, but essentially like I am tired of my heart getting beat up. Mm -hmm. So I am going to create some really thick walls around my heart, around me. So that one people stop criticizing me. I look more tough, you know, so they can't tell me I'm too sensitive. And if I have these walls, then I'm not as vulnerable to getting hurt seen that quite a bit too. Oh yes, I can relate to that one because I was going to ask you and I really appreciate how you phrase it as coping. 
because even when we are not tapping into these skills or these parts of us, it's coping. It's not because we are consciously trying to like cover that up. And, but yeah, I really, for me, I think when you said coping, there was like this wave of compassion because we just want to survive. And for me, it was, I think during my teenage years to university, somehow I managed to kind of build a wall around me and I, I would see sad videos or watch sad movies, but I wouldn't feel anything. Like I, my mind knew it was sad, but I was like, oh, it's, it's fine. Mm. And I, it, unconsciously, I had numbed that part of me. Wow. I'm curious, did you find that that had, at least looking back, negative impacts on you? Mm, I think, so I think I tipped towards the always positive part mm. so much. So if something bad happened, I would be like, oh, but this is, at least I'm alive, at least all those things. So all the bad feelings was not to be felt. And as I learn about vulnerability and then getting into a relationship with my husband back then and just really learning to open up and have that safe space to, you know, to tell them, hey, I feel like crap today. Because growing up, maybe from an Asian family, you were not allowed to complain or you shouldn't complain unless it's productive, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So So am I hearing that if you if you had stayed maybe closed and self-protective, that might have kept you from gaining the intimacy that you did with your husband? A hundred percent. And friends, Uh, like even with friends, they always saw me as happy, extroverted to my closest friends. mm -hmm. But I think I was still hiding the parts of me that wanted to be helped, that wanted someone to say, hey, I had a shitty day, even though it wasn't as dramatic as people breaking up and all those things. I just feel sad. And I never had Mm. that space because I thought their problems growing up were was always worse than mine. Wow. Wow. And it seems just in knowing you as for the time that I have that you're just more and more like opening up to who you truly are, whole and unleashed, you know, just being the full you. And it, it, it seems like it's inviting so much connection into your life. Yeah. Freedom. And you know, what's funny. I think at first I felt so disconnected hmm. because I moved, we moved around a lot growing up. I was always like a visitor, like I was born in Peru, terrorism was bad. So we came to Canada, but only for a couple of years because we're going back to Peru, but only for a couple of years because you're coming here for university. So even when I was here in university and had my own life, I'm like only for a couple of years because I want to explore the world. (laughs) So I I, I didn't allow myself to belong either or lean into parts of me. And I guess now that I'm doing that inner work, you're right. It's, it's my, my sister's like, you have friends now. You have so many people because <laughs> she used to make fun of me growing up. I had like a really tight group of friends and that was it. I was comfortable. And for her, she had, she knew people from everywhere. She was, she, she still is very friendly, but now she's like, look at you. You've got friends from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I just have so much compassion for that younger you because I think for anybody, that type of international moving would be very challenging. And then for an HSP, we're very, very sensitive to transitions and change. And you were having these radical cultural transitions. I'm just like, gosh, of course you had to find a way to kind of close yourself up for a period of time or close maybe your heart up, you know? Yeah, yeah. I just, it makes so much sense. And it's so beautiful that now you're in a place in your life where it's safe to, to not do that. Yeah. Now I can cry with anything and it just feels so good to feel even like the painful moments that I didn't allow myself to. Mm. Just beautiful. Oh, tell me a little bit about your experience as you learn about HSB and start to integrate it in your practice. Yeah, it's really interesting. I learned about HSP, I think right after the, uh, there's a book, the seminal book on the topic by Dr. Elaine Aaron is called The Highly Sensitive Person. And I think somebody, maybe my mom gave it to me when I was in college. So it had just come out. And I remember being really like, what? This is a thing, you know, it just, 
I think I felt grief for the amount of shame that I had felt around it and not knowing that nothing was wrong with me. I also think I felt like, okay, what do I do with this? Like what right. now? <laughs> so thinking back, I, I think I, I kind of tucked that HSP knowledge away for a bunch of years. Like, oh uh, yeah, you know, I'll, I don't know what to do with this. Okay. That's a thing. So then, you know, some years later, I start going to grad school, I become a therapist. And I remember a couple of years into, into being a therapist, I was trying to clarify, who am I really passionate about serving? Like, mm -hmm. who, who are my people that I want to really, you know, make myself available to? And when I thought about it, I realized it's highly sensitive people. When I thought about all the people I feel like I've been most supportive to and most helpful with, they were all highly sensitive people. And so when I realized that it really opened the door for me to dive back into that topic of like, okay, if this is a fundamental part of me, this is a fundamental part of the people that I want to be serving, I need to know everything about this. So I was in my, I think, mid to late twenties and I just started devouring everything I could get my hands on about HSP, which of course it was serving my clients, but then it was also serving me, right? Right. Like I think it was a process, but I started slowly integrating what I was learning into how I saw myself, you know, bringing in more acceptance. And then honestly, a lot of my work is trying to save people the time that I spent because so little is known about this. There's so few people who specialize in this. I spent, I want to say 10 years just trying to figure out what I needed to make life work as an HSP. Yeah. That was a long journey of like supporting people. And every time I'd find something new and go, ah, oh, this is so big, you know, then I'd bring that to my clients. Yeah. And also healing process. yourself in the process, yeah. I can imagine. So well said. Yeah. The, and that was a huge part of my process was not just how do, how can I live better, but wow, where are my traumas, mm -hmm. whether having to do with HSP or not, but what is in the way as well at this point, what, what am I carrying from the past that is just no longer serving me and addressing that, which is, truth be told, how I got into trauma therapy because I experienced it myself as utterly life-changing. And I was like, oh, I need to be able to offer this to the people I serve. Right. So do you only specialize in AH, uh, HSV people or also like any, what is your clientele like? So I have two, two businesses. So there's my private practice and then my online um, community. So in my private practice, I don't you know, turn away non HSPs. Um, mm -hmm. But at this point, my practice is called the therapeutic center for highly sensitive people. So I think <laughs> most people who are like, that sounds good, yeah, <laughs> are yeah. probably highly sensitive. Um, but I would say there, I definitely have some clients who are um, non HSP. And then online, it's all HSP because it's all HSP specific services. Mm. What is I mean, that might be a really general question, but what is the biggest transformation from them embracing their mm. highly sensitive persona and actually, wow, healing through the trauma? Mm. Is there any resistance at first? Okay, let me make sure I understand your question. So both, is there resistance to getting that healing for anybody? Mm -hmm. Great yeah. question. And when they do get the healing, like what, how does it transform their lives? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I just had to make I, sure I got That it. was great. I think I was asking too, too many things at once and you picked it up. So I heard subtlety. it. No, I heard it. It's perfect. I just had to do that for myself. Um, and that honestly, what I just did there is a little, you know, if you want to see behind the scenes, that's a little stalling tactic for my deep processing, right? If I just tried to go, uh, okay, the answer is when my head was still picking up, oh, this is a very nuanced question. 
Oh. I let myself take the time to go, let me just make sure I've got it so that I can answer in a way that isn't stressful. I've needed this tip all my life because <laughs> I'm so excited to answer. I'm like, oh, oh, give me a second. <laughs> that was a there great tip. <laughs> I use it all the time. <laughs> so to answer your first question, where do people have resistance? That's such a good question. I honestly think therapy and coaching is quite a bit actually about where's the resistance. Because yeah. once there's no resistance, we can getting to the the transformation is way easy, but as complex humans, we, we quite often have resistance. So by the time we're adults, highly sensitive adults, a lot of us are carrying a just boatload of shame. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm so like real deep shame. I know I had that like deep down, really feeling broken and unworthy. And so I think that is a fundamental resistance when say a therapist is like, hey, let's go into that shame. <laughs> You're like, excuse me. <laughs> no, you know, it's, there can definitely be a very human response of, I have spent years trying to distance myself from all of that pain. Why the mm -hmm. hell would I want to open that door? Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So a lot of my process in working with people is in working with the resistance and, and helping those protector parts of them that are like, you can't go there to just talk it through and find out, you know, is that, is this protection still needed? Mm. Is there room to maybe tweak the way that you protect the wounded parts of yourself? Could we go really slow and maybe just dip our toe in and go mm. at a pace that is tolerable? So I, I basically, a lot of the work is kind of like, how do we do this in a way that feels doable and honoring re-traumatizing them, and not re-traumatizing them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And for anybody who's considered trauma work, a big piece of at least the trauma work that I do. And most of them is we are not re-traumatizing. You know, you can get healed without having to relive the trauma in a way that is traumatizing. So that I would say is a big piece of resistance. What's another? You know, I think some people really committed to the belief that they need to change who they fundamentally are. Mm. And I mean, those people probably aren't going to end up working with me because I just so embody the opposite of that. But you know, if somebody, this kind of ties into the shame, if somebody's really committed to no, this part of me is wrong. I need to stop being affected by stuff so much. I need to knock it off and learn some tools and tricks. You know, um, they're going to feel resistant potentially to the idea of what if that's not the stance you need to take with yourself? What if we don't need to make you someone you're not? Ultimately, it becomes, as you know, incredibly freeing, but at first it can bring up some resistance. Yeah, especially if the new persona you've adapted and become, you've embodied, uh, feels more accepted by others. How the hell do you just say, you know, go back to who you truly are? That's a really hard disconnect and, you know, yeah. Are you ready to create space for ease and alignment? I've created a free starter guide to help you go from frazzled to focus. It's a guide for the overwhelmed go-getter who's eager to find more ease, clarity, and alignment in their lives, so you can quiet the noise and strengthen your connection within. After all, we can't align what we don't know is misaligned. Simply grab your free copy at wholeandunleashed.com slash guide brilliant point and i have heard that numerous times from clients of like who am i gonna be mm -hmm. i don't even know who's under there i've been this persona for so long what's that person gonna look like am i gonna be crying 24 7 no mm -hmm. but there's the fear you know am i gonna be totally are people gonna reject me so you're a hundred percent right it's it's really courageous work to do this
Yeah. And I can imagine it being a process too, because you don't just go from embodying this part of you that you've hidden with a lock for so many years and being comfortable with it. I think there, there's probably going to be a lot of discomfort as part of the growing pain. That's what you called it, I think. Yes, yes, there are growing pains and you're so right and it's so wise. This is a process. I mean, I am still in process. I have been on this process personally for 10 plus years and there are still new little aspects of me that I am working on accepting, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah, it takes time. And when people are hurting, a lot of times they want to rip the bandaid off. Okay. Yeah. Let me heal it all right now. And you know, a lot of my work is like, no, we can't do that. Cause that's traumatizing. It's not respectful of you. It doesn't really work that way. So the truth is, yeah, this deep healing work, it's, it's slow, it's slow. And, and in my experience, slow in a good way, it's like digestible. Yeah. It takes you know? as long as it takes. <laughs> it takes. Yes. You're so wise. I just feel like oh. you're full of so many nuggets. <laughs> I've learned it the hard well. way. <laughs> <laughs> I rush things. I'm in, I can be very patient and very impatient. Like, oh, uh, you get that even with like physical healing. If I do all the right things, my body will feel great and be in balance. No, it doesn't. <laughs> man, I hear you, sister. I've learned so many things the hard way too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I love that. It takes as long as it takes. I just wrote that down. <laughs> there so the- was one one point that you share when you talked about trauma. And it just, I don't know if it's a tangent, but it might be like an interesting avenue to explore because yeah. is it fair to say that we all have some degree of trauma? Hmm. I I would I would venture to say yes. Um living well one living through the pandemic I think that's been traumatizing to some degree for almost everybody um living in this if okay if you're an HSP living in this world that is really intense and often too chaotic for our nervous systems that can be traumatizing you know living with a marginalized identity in for American culture, for example, that devalues and, and, you know, marginalizes and has prejudice that in and of itself is traumatizing. So I feel like there are unfortunately ways that probably all of us have some degree of trauma. Yeah. And the reason I ask is because I, I saw my naturopath a couple of years ago, I was feeling a little bit out of balance. And one of the first things she said to me was like, do you see a therapist? I'm like, what? I'm fine. <laughs> I, I always liked the idea of one, but I didn't feel like it was an imminent need mm-hmm. until she recommended me to one. And we started talking and I realized I grew up with, just like I think a lot of people with a lot of trauma, but I was unaware of it because I tend to compare and say, hey, you know, not the grass is greener. What's the opposite of the grass is green on the other side? Everybody oh, right. has it worse. I'm fine. It's, what did you say? Everybody oh, has it Everyone worse. has it worse. Yeah. Yeah. So I shouldn't complain. So that was my kind of like, my life hasn't been crappy and not saying that it was, but you, your life can be beautiful and still have moments of trauma. Yes. Yeah. That's so true. That's something I hear very, very often in working with people when I bring up this concept that they've been through things we could consider trauma, quite often I'll hear that, oh, but I, you know, I had, there were meals on the table and at some deep level, I knew my parents loved me and oh my gosh, so many people have had it so much worse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Brene Brown talks about comparative suffering. I don't know if you've heard her name that, that like, when we compare our suffering and devalue our suffering or raise our suffering over others, it's like, it's really pointless. The fact is, you know, I I like to use the metaphor of, let's say somebody standing next to me, her, you know, had lost part of her leg. Mm -hmm. And then I'm standing here with a huge gash in my leg, dripping blood. Would I go, no, 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 whatever. I, you know, keep going, Brooke, keep going on with your day. You're fine. At least you have your leg. Oh, no. Such a great visual (laughs) representation of what it means. Right. Right. 
you'd go and get you get your leg looked at and healed, treated. Yeah. So really trauma is subjective. There's mm-hmm. no hierarchy of trauma. I mean, I think we could sure say that, you know, certain traumas maybe have more of an impact than others, but it doesn't, it, it's irrelevant. If I have yeah. something that for me was utterly overwhelming and really painful, it deserves attention, period. Mm-hmm. Same for yeah. you. Yeah, something I've really learned as I grew up and embrace all the things, even if it's sad, oh. embrace that sadness. It's yours. Doesn't mean anything is wrong with you. Wow. That's mm-hmm. right. I'd love to go back to your second question about the transformation. Mm, yes. <laughs> so when people, I mean, there's so many possibilities for transformation depending on each person's unique story, unique hardships. Maybe I'll speak to mine. I'll tell you about mine just as a data set of one, but the, but what I've experienced, the transformation I've experienced, I see in a lot of people I work with as well. Um, I went from constant anxiety, like I remember vividly in my 20s, going to a coffee shop was very stressful for me. I remember just, and I couldn't always say why. I had very generalized anxiety. I was just oh, I couldn't settle. I was always scanning for some kind of danger. And now I rarely use the word anxiety in describing my experience. Yeah. It was like, it was a daily constant experience. And now, you know, I'll have it when it's appropriate, like, oh, I'm about ready to turn in this thing or, you know, be visible in this way. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm having some anxiety, but the rest of the time I don't have it. Um, I used to get triggered really easily, uh, especially in certain situations. If someone said something that pushed a certain button, a part of me would get just very triggered, whether it be stressed or angry or scared. And it, I mean, this could be daily where I'd feel just like kind of the rug up pulled out from under me. I'm feeling Mm -hmm. okay. And now I'm really not. And now I would say that happens like one, one hundredth of the time. I just don't get triggered that easily. I'm affected by stuff Mm -hmm. because I'm sensitive, but I'm not, I don't go to that place of like extreme reaction. Interesting. Does that make sense? Because you understand why now? Unfortunately, it had to be a lot deeper than that. It was, it was doing trauma work. It was doing trauma work because trauma work like EMDR, which is what I practice, it actually gets to the level of the body and the unconscious where we're holding all of this deep pain and it allows the pain to resolve itself. So it's almost like having a festering wound that for, for my whole life. So, it, and every time someone would like drop something on it, I'd be oh. like, ah, sorry. Of course. All this <laughs> but that's how you, it right. helps. It totally yeah, helps. It across. Yeah. And then finally through trauma healing work, my, my um, wound was able to heal, is able to scab over and then, mm-hmm. and then heal. And so when someone dropped something on my arm, it was like, oh, you know, mm. it had a less of a re- reaction. Oh, that, that is so sense? powerful. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, trauma stays in our body. And I think we understand it conceptually, yes. but we might not make the connection on how to release it. Yeah. And I've tried EMDR, like eye movement. Desensitization what? and That's reprocessing. It. Yes, I've done it with my therapist. And it, yes. you know, it seems so simple, but I did feel like a weight has been lifted. Maybe because somebody wow. held a space for me to talk about something that I've never re- even realized that affected me. Wow. And then, you know, including my body, because we often forget about our bodies. We're yeah. so mental and like, let's do things. And your body is like, but you're so tired, <laughs> but you're holding on to so much. <laughs> Yes, please listen to me. Yeah, when we go into our bodies, that I mean, there's so much that's possible for us there. 
And that was another one for me. It sounds like maybe for your, your, your journey as well is reconnecting with my body. Just like you said, I was so in my head and in large part because my body hadn't felt like a safe place to be because there was so much mm-hmm. emotion in there that I didn't know how to deal with. So I now am I'm much more embodied. I, I feel comfortable being in my body. And that allows me to be in touch with my intuition, be in touch with my boundaries. Ah, yes. I would love to explore the boundaries topic. Okay. There was something that you said. Oh. It's in the tip of my tongue. Yeah. It'll probably come back. Yeah. Uh, oh, I know you mentioned at the beginning that there's spectrum of sensitivity. Yes. I wanted to ask, there's also different types of sensitivity, right? Like mm-hmm. audio, visual, <laughs> all those. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really that's a really interesting point. I haven't thought about that for a while. So there's sensory sensitivity, there's emotional sensitivity, relational sensitivity. Those are the ones that are coming to me right now. Mm -hmm. And um, most people who work with me, I feel like have a, a combo of some sensitivity in all of those areas, but there are times where certain Uh, HSPs are like sensitive to, let's say there's a really scratchy tag in the back of their shirt where they're like, oh, I can't forget that. Or like that music is too loud and they're just really aware of their sensory environment, but maybe emotionally they don't feel as sensitive to say others' moods Mm -hmm. or to picking up on the pain of others. Um, whereas a lot of the work I'm doing right now is with people who have more energetic sensitivity and emotional sensitivity. So they're Mm -hmm. picking up, you know, wow, I've had people say, and this used to be me constantly, you know, I can walk into the room and feel everybody's everything. I know who's having a bad day and not just, it's not just that I know it, but I suddenly feel it in my body. I soak it up like a sponge. Yeah. Yeah. And that's honestly the first chunk of work I did was supporting a lot of the emotionally sensitive and especially the sensory sensitive stuff. Mm -hmm. And as I've learned more, I feel like the biggest need for HSPs is around energetic sensitivity. Oh, yes. Yes. Let's dive into that. Boundaries, energies. How do we start? (laughs) Where do we start? (laughs) Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) Honestly, I didn't, I didn't teach this for so long because I didn't feel like I knew the way. There's Mm -hmm. so little out there around what this is that I'll go into in a second, what to do about it. And so I really did a deep dive the last number of years myself and I'm kind of have found a bunch of stuff and I'm coming forward with what I've learned. Okay. So energetic boundaries, I learned that term, um, through this author, Cindy Dale, and she wrote a book called energetic boundaries and she really lays out what they are beautifully. So if someone's interested in this, it's a great place to start. So essentially energetic boundaries are energy fields that emanate out of our body, kind of from our body and outwards. And who knows how how far out they go, maybe a few feet. And I know that can sound a little like woo woo or a little, that's kind of a weird concept. But what I would remind people is we have physical a physical field. So like our skin is a physical field that keeps our blood and our bones and all the stuff inside of us from like spilling out. So similarly, an energetic field keeps all of our our emotions, our energies, our thoughts, you know, the the energy that we carry around with us from just spilling out everywhere. And it keeps all that energy from other people, from the world, from just inundating us and overwhelming us. So before I go a step further, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And I think sometimes because it's not visual, 
but I think you can feel it just like when someone is sad or someone's angry, you know, not to get close to them because yes. is that energetic? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And that's the thing. Even if you've never heard this term, you can feel someone's energy, mm. right? You can feel it. You know it when, yeah, don't go near them or gosh, she just has like such a warm vibe to her. That's their energy. Yeah. You know, you can't really point to where it lives, but you can feel it. Yeah. So these energetic boundaries, we need them, especially as sensitive people so that we're not taking on every bit of pollution in our environment, right? Yeah. Pollution, and, <laughs> like how you right? say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And here, here's the thing that I finally realized um, is that if you are a sensitive person who's gone through any type of hardship, whether it with your family or something you experienced as an adult, it could be um, issues or with addiction, it could be any kind of trauma, your energetic boundaries got damaged. So it almost be like getting holes poked in my skin. And wow, I'm giving just a lot of skin and bones and metaphors, but that's how we understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you imagine if you had holes poked through your skin, you bacteria would come in, right? Like you get sick if you just walked around like that. And so what happens is hard hard things that we go through or unsupportive dynamics we live in can <clears throat> damage our energetic boundaries and essentially poke holes in them. And when we have holes in our energetic boundaries, and this is, I think, when I, when I look at a lot of my life, because I had holes in my energetic boundaries, I was exhausted from feeling at all that pollution from the outside was just coming right on in. And so I was feeling everybody's feelings. I was taking on and taking in everybody's energy and my body and my being were exhausted from it and distressed from it. I love the connection with the physical translation. Mm. Again, energetic is something you can feel. You can't really describe or like poke it, but it translates to your body, like people getting sick. I think that's a huge one. Yes. 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 Getting, yeah. And you're right. That's such a good point. These energetic, this energetic damage we can sustain then does affect us emotionally, physically in very concrete ways. Some people will actually take on the physical symptoms of other people, mm. or they will get so worn down that they will get sick themselves. So Essentially, a lot of the people that I work with who are HSPs, who are like, I am so tired of feel of carrying the weight of the world on my back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very common for us. Yeah. Oh, I think a piece of that is, wow, you are so beautifully empathetic. You are attuned to subtlety. So you notice it, you notice when someone's expression has fatigue behind their eyes, you, you mm -hmm. see it. Um, and you have this amazing intuition. So you can pick up on the, un, the unseen. And then, so all these gifts, plus these holes poked in your energetic boundaries means that it's like on overdrive. It's and almost it's, like you know, a burden then. The burden then. Mm -hmm. It's a hundred percent a burden then. Is it, is it fair to say that a lot of people with anxiety are misdiagnosed HSP? Mm, I, is that a possibility? Is that a I connection? I love so much that you asked that question. It is 100% a possibility. And quite honestly, a lot of the clients who come to me or the, a lot of the how am I trying to say this? One of the things I offer my clients because I have this awareness of HSP is being able to go, oh, that, that diagnosis doesn't fit. Mm. You know, you don't have, 
you don't have major depression, you don't have clinical anxiety, you have a highly sensitive nervous system that hasn't been supported. Oh. Or you never learned, a lot of times it's trauma-based as well. You never got support to, to process your feelings. So you just had to shove them down. Well, if you shove your feelings down for long enough, you're gonna look depressed. Mm. And, and I wanna say a caveat here that we can both have HSP issues and trauma and depression and anxiety. Right. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think quite often it's misdiagnosed. Thank you for clarifying that it's not just one thing and yeah. <laughs> you don't get yeah. anything else. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it can be easy for people to be like, oh my gosh, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. But it, it's complex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like layered. I love how you talked about layered. this. And so what happens with all those energetic holes? How do you yeah. start healing or patching those holes up? Yes. So, so, so good. And that is, that's exactly it. It's healing those holes. It's close. They can close back up. And I think for many years, I felt like they can't, I, I did, I had never found something that would allow for them to heal. And so I thought, oh, maybe you just have to live with it. Mm. So there is a lot to that. Um, that is really the work that I'm doing with people right now is creating a system that's pretty robust because it's not just like one or two things. It's kind of a, it's, it's a, um, it requires a lot, but I want to give you and, and your viewers like a few things to consider. Okay. One is, so this doesn't, okay. There's two layers. There's one the deeper layer is how do we actually heal the holes so that certain stuff doesn't come in to begin with. And then this, the other piece is, okay, how, but when it does come in, how do you then respond to it in a way that is healthy and helps, helps that energy kind of move back out? So the, the first layer, the how do we actually heal the holes, that is deep work. That is the trauma therapy. That is, you know, this is some of the work that I do with folks, whether it be trauma therapy or looking at deep beliefs that you've taken in about, oh, I guess it's my job to hold everybody's crap. Or, you know, good people really take on, help other people fix their feelings. So we have to like, it takes some, some really rich digging of like, what kind of beliefs and stuff did I absorb that maybe aren't serving me anymore? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking about it in my life and all, the, all these nuggets of wisdom you're giving us, Brooke, oh, I'm just feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Yeah, I, I, and I relate to that. I've had so many moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, like, oh, the dots are connecting. I could see how that would affect me. If I think I have to be, for example, example in my family, I took on this, this role of like the holder of emotions. Ooh. I had parents who did not, to varying degrees, did not know how to feel their feelings. Mm -hmm. And so they really rejected their feelings and denied oh. their feelings. And as a sensitive being, you could feel it. I could feel it. And somehow I came to believe, oh, it's my job to hold it for them mm -hmm. and maybe even fix their pain for them. And, you know, that was something I carried into adulthood without realizing it. So I really had to explore that. Mm -hmm. Like, is that really a role that I still want? You know? Yeah. <sighs> So that's, there's a lot of deep pieces there and that's definitely work that I do with folks. And then there's also similarly some more, some like more kind of concrete tools. And so I wanna give you a couple and your viewers a couple. So one is this simple question. I did not co coin this, but I love it. And the question is, is this mine? So I just, I just used this the other day. I'm gonna give an example to illustrate it. I was running a group a group, um, a group call and somebody on the call was having some, some emotions were coming up for her. And all of a sudden I felt this like tightness 
in my chest, like this squeezing, it's very uncomfortable. And in the past, I would have just gone like, oh my gosh, I'm really anxious. What's going on? I would have gotten anxious about this feeling. Right. And what I learned to do, because it was so out of the blue and didn't match how I was feeling, is I I literally asked myself, is this mine? Is this feeling mine? And my body, my, my maybe intuition, my body just said no. Like I could just feel it. I just heard a no. And I've learned to believe that. Oh, yes. Believing that instead of letting our mind override it and say, maybe you're anxious. Maybe it's you because our minds, it goes there. (laughs) Totally goes there. I Yes, exactly. I spent years and years going, no, 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 it is you or Mm. shut up, inner voice. (laughs) Yeah. I listen. And when I said, is this mine? No, I could release it. Um, There's a lot of ways to do that. Sometimes there's, there's a phrase return to sender, you know, kind of like, I'm going to give this back to the person who it belongs to. In, in this case for me, and quite often, I just felt like it kind of released it to God, to the universe. Like I don't need to hold this. And immediately I felt it dissipate. um, It's funny because I started using that when I realized how sensitive I was to people's emotions. I didn't Ah. notice that like I would absorb everything like my friends used to come for me and they had like a heartbreak and after talking to me my heart was broken and then they leave like I'm feeling so much better and I'm like why do I feel like crap now that's it (laughs) yeah I'm like why do I feel like crap exactly and I took it I'm like I'll do it for you (laughs) this is my badge of honor oh yes and then you're like limping around yeah and I'm like why am I so sad I don't think I want to work with people one-on-one because I take on their feelings but like you said I think once I recognize that it's not my feeling is it mine that's one of the things I started asking and I read somewhere that you can just imagine like a colander I'm like okay I let it sift through me it can bounce away I love that can I use that of course of course you're sharing so many things with me that's not even mine I just read it somewhere like just imagine a colander (laughs) but like what isn't yours will sift through and whatever is is yeah. And actually Ma- Miriam Hosna, who does a lot of great work on energetic boundaries. I remember now that she does that. She goes, what percentage of this is mine? Something like this uh-huh. to acknowledge sometimes a little bit is ours. Like to go back to my experience in the group, maybe a little bit was like empathy. I was feeling for this person, but let's say 95% was not mine. Mm-hmm. So you can even get nuanced like that. And I just suggest for the people wondering, so when do I use this? Mm -hmm. I'd say as often as you'd like, anytime you are having emotion, maybe specifically either emotion or feeling in your body that you're like, it doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. Like nothing is going on in your life that really matches that. That would be a great time to go, is this mine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one, I think that tool can be profound at just the shift of like, oh, and by the way, side note, if it's not ours, not only don't we need to carry it, but we literally can't digest it. Like we can't digest food for somebody else. We Mm. can't digest someone else's emotions for them. Right. It's not even like serving the world. Do you know what I mean? Especially because you want to help someone yeah. but you can't it's not up to us thank you for sharing that for yeah. pointing it out <laughs> yeah it's like what well, yeah even though we want to I mean it'd be one thing if it actually worked but it doesn't really mm-hmm. so one more tool I'll give people who want to start playing with their energy and and keeping their energy protected and clean um is at the end of the day or let's say you just come out of like a meeting that's stressful or an interaction that's stressful is imagining. And by the way, this is a random visual that came to me. Use your imagination. Like if something else works for you, great. Like we are visual creatures. So I pictured like a Swiffer duster. Do you know, have you seen those? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're like just a little duster thing and they pick up dust really well. 
And I pictured, I will picture dragging it down from my head down to my toes and then back up and imagine dragging it through my body and that it's picking up anything that I don't need to be carrying. Any energy that maybe I just absorbed by walking through the world, anything that I can release. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, even though it can seem like, how does that work? Our, our deep brain is very visual. And so just doing something like that can make us go, oh, okay. I can allow that to be swept away. Yeah. It's yeah. like mindfully, intentionally releasing. Because yes. we hold on to things without knowing. Like if we don't do any awareness work, I know I didn't for the longest time. I was like in advertising, everything was due two weeks ago, run, run, run. So I never had the time to slow down. And sometimes when you haven't slowed down for so long and you're forced to, either you get sick, it's overwhelming. All the messages that you have been ignoring. But I think just being intentional about like, maybe this is one thing I can do to release it or maybe feel it. That is such a powerful exercise. That's, I really love how you put that, that it can, when you start opening up awareness of how you're actually doing, it can be overwhelming. And I think that's a great point of even just like, can I help myself by 5%? Can doing this visual or asking, is this mine? Maybe that'll allow me to release 5% of the overwhelm I'm feeling. Yeah. And if you keep doing that, it, it adds up. Like it'll get you there as evidenced by you. Cause you're not where you were whenever that was, however many Thank years ago. God. Thank yeah. God. It was four years ago, but it also feels like a lifetime ago because of how yeah. much I released. Mm, I could imagine that. Oh gosh. These tools and tips, Brooke, thank you so much. My I'm sure pleasure. listeners are super excited about it. My pleasure. It's really my joy to bring this stuff, um, you know, to, to a higher level of awareness for people because we need it so bad. We do. And I think also because it's such huge parts of ourselves that we were so ashamed of. I know you brought in the language of shame, just mm -hmm. having someone to hold that space for you mm -hmm. and say, I see you. And there's nothing wrong with you. And it sounds almost like cliche in your head, but I know, I know that feeling of someone really embracing you and helping you embrace that part. Yeah. It's kind of everything. I don't, I think we need that. I think as a, such a fundamental human need and beautifully put. Yeah. Just want to be seen and yeah. appreciated for whatever we are. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any final tips, words of advice, suggestions you have? You know, I speak to if anybody's hearing this and they haven't heard of a highly sensitive person before, if any of this is new to them and I just want, and if you're feeling any degree of overwhelm, I just want you to know how normal that is, that this I'm not, you know, we're not just talking about strategies. We're talking about a whole paradigm for how you see yourself now in the future and in your entire past. So if anybody is like, whoa, oh my gosh, that energetic boundaries thing is really hitting home or that HSP thing, just give yourself time to kind of, to digest it. Mm -hmm. you now let yourself have any emotions that come up around it. Um, don't, don't try to force yourself to move through that too quickly because in that processing that's like the first big step and you can't skip that does that make we sense we all want to yeah we all want to we yeah, want to we get to the to. final one we want to be yeah. on the other side already but yeah. the process is so important to integrate everything it is yes oh. well I've got some rapid fire questions for you okay are you excited <laughs> Um, it's funny when you told me about those as an HSP, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> well, so what I usually tell people is like, it's rapid fire, but you can take your time, which kind oh, of just neutralizes that. this, but I I'm just that. like, well, wrap up questions. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Okay. I can take my time. <laughs> you can take your time. What's the best compliment you've ever received? 
You know, I had a therapist who called me a growth monster. <laughs> and like we have we were have a very good rapport. So I knew he was being really playful and like I just loved it. Like I'm ravenous about growing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so beautiful. <laughs> a book that's changed your life. You know, uh, as a teenager, I read two books, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn and I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And I'm blanking on the author's name of the first book. Um, but those were just really, really profound to me as a teenager. And I'll just add any book that you mentioned throughout the interview also in the show notes so that if people are curious about it, they can find it. Because I know oh, when yeah. I listen to something, I'm like, I want it all. I need to do all the research. Yeah. What does coming home to you mean? Mm. And are we talking like literal home or like metaphorical home? Metaphorical. Home uh, to yourself. Oh, beautiful. You know, like we talked about earlier, it really involves embodiment for me. I think I was disconnected from my, my body, my essence for a lot of years. And so it's coming home to my body, to my emotions, to my intuition. And it just, it feels warm and inviting and really grounded. Mm. What would you like more of? I would like more ease. Yeah. <sighs> Any advice or words for your younger self? I would tell her to trust herself. Just blanket statement. Yeah. Yeah. Where can people find you, get more resources from you? Yes, I would love them to come check me out. We have a brand new website actually that we're launching as of today that we're recording this. Oh my God. And I'm so excited. So you can find me at intuitivewarriorway.com. We have some free resources, an HSP survival toolkit. Pretty soon we're gonna have a workshop all about energetic boundaries that I talked about today. And then we have other options for coaching and some really uh, robust courses to support HSPs. Amazing. And definitely check it out. I know you also have an Instagram page where you share a lot of your tips as well. Yes, I do. And that is at the HSP therapist. We'll include that as well. And this might be like a really fi random final question, but HSPs were sensitive of energies. What about those people whose energy just expands and just, you know, pokes into others' energy? Do you have any <laughs> thought around that? There, I mean, that's a reality. That's a reality that there are people who are energetically violent. There are people who are oh. energetically intrusive. And it's hard because it's hard to prove, but you can feel it, right? You can feel yeah. it. What you just said, I've been there too, where you're like, this doesn't feel good. Um, yeah. so that's actually something in, in a, a new course I'm working on, on energetic boundaries that we have a whole module exploring of what do you do? What do you do when, um, when it's a bad energy dynamic essentially. And I think the number one thing I'd share with people is listen to yourself. I spent mm -hmm. so many years invalidating my experience and going, no, no, no you're fine. They seem nice enough. And the number yeah. one thing to start doing is take it seriously. If you do not feel good about around somebody, take that seriously. Get curious. Well, huh, what is it? Is it just a feeling? Is it a certain way they look at me, a certain way they talk to me, a way they treat others? And then if you can't even, you know, maybe you can't put your finger on what it is, but listen to that and ask yourself, what do I need here? Because the answer from yourself might be, I need to keep my distance, Yeah. you know? Or if you're in a position, like say this is a coworker and you can't not be at work with them, it might be like, I need to start setting boundaries in certain ways, like limiting the length of our conversations or you know what I mean? Just different things to create some of that distance. Mm. Yes. Yes, I'm so glad I asked it because as you were sharing, I was like, but what about those people that you, I didn't know they were called like energetically violent and they're probably not even aware of it. It's just how some they project. Not. No, yeah. Um, yeah, so some of them are just really 
this people with poor boundaries themselves. And they just don't even know that they're kind of sliming the world as they walk <laughs> through it. <laughs> oh it's good to know what we can do or even people yeah. that can notice that. <laughs> Yes. And there's definitely more, you know, that that's, that won't solve it all, but that's a really, really important starting place, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, Brooke, thank you for everything you've shared today. I was like on the edge of my seat listening to you like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So I really appreciate you taking time out of your day and congratulations on your website launch. Thank you, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. You're just so lovely to talk to and it's so fun to share with somebody who's like, it's relevant to you. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.